we're pleased to uh, have William Walters uh, with us today. William is a professor in the Department of Political Science and as well as the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Carleton University. William has, has worked on different issues, but with regards to borders and migration, his uh, recent work has paid close attention to what he calls the margins of migration control. Now for those of us, and I'm sure there's quite a few of us here, who've been sort of raised or educated in a field where William was present already, um, and we've been doing research on border migration, last, in, you know, started doing it in the last five, 10 years. Um, in, in a way, I, I was looking at his research interest and I thought that for me, it, it's not marginal anymore, uh, but William's contributed in shifting the locus of research on border and control from the border itself to what once seemed marginal uh, object, carrier section, visa regimes, and other techniques of what uh, builders aim, you know, call the techniques that are aimed at governing at a distance. So the fact that these once marginal sites seems obvious to me as, as an object to study, I think should be considered as a sign of the relevance and the relative success of, uh, of Williams and Daver and, and other colleagues that were doing similar work. Um, yet, William keeps moving to study phenomena that uh, offer original insight on border and on control and on migration. And he's, he's recently uh, focused on deportation and the management of the uh, stowaway by carriers. There's a really interesting article uh, from, I think, 2008 in, um, in Borderlands, the e-journal. And today we'll talk about vehicles, routes, and transporta transportation infrastructure, um, all objects that are still, but maybe not for long, marginal in borders and migration studies. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm a former um, it alumnus of York. I'm not, oh, I guess you're never a former. You're an alumnus for life, aren't you? Like, so I am an alumnus of York. And it's very nice to come back to this permanent construction site. <laughs> Always in one. Um, so in, in, in the presentation today, I'd like to think about the absence and presence, because I think it's both, of um, vehicles and transportation infrastructures. How long should I talk for, by the way? As long as you want, but 40 I'll try minutes, 30 else? minutes, yeah, I'll try to aim for that. So just give me a shout when I've done 25 minutes, will you? Yeah. So I'd like to talk about um, vehicles and transportation infrastructures and, and their sort of how to think about them in relationship to, to migration politics. And I start with the proposition that the vehicles are, for the most part, missing in theoretical and critical analyses. And I'll come back and qualify that a bit later on. But I want to argue that, that political scientists and, and, and theorists and sociologists of migration interested in a more critical knowledge than the standard policy approaches would benefit from taking vehicles more seriously. So I propose to offer some reasons for this and a few concepts to assist in the work of finding a place for vehicles and their interactions with persons. And then I'll offer a, a case to flesh some of that out. Um, we, we heard, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this work I've done on stowaways, hello, um, in ports and on ships. And uh, I think thinking about the ship as a little territory, or, or more specifically a, a locus of territorialization in its own right, and a sort of irreducible locale of struggle and control, can complicate how we understand what and where migration control happens and enrich the discussion about the dispersion of borders in contemporary societies. So this sort of interest in vehicles and very material and, and mundane entities like trains, tunnels and ships and their entanglement in regimes of power and social struggles is part of my longer, uh, longer standing interest in, in what, uh, following the introduction, we could call a sort of X uh, minor politics of mobility and migration. So, I mean, my methodological guideline here has been to zone in on ordinary bits that are usually overlooked by the major research paradigms or the fall between the gaps of the disciplines. Um, to look at mediators and material objects and associations out of which assemblages of power are composed. 
Um, but there's a sort of theoretical dimension to this sort of focus on the minor politics of migration. Um, and it's not just about some trying to give a fuller picture, um, not just about trying to get greater detail. I think there are, uh, there are additional reasons um, for looking at these sort of banal things. I think it's because it can also help to disrupt and unsettle uh, dominant theoretical frameworks and to reveal blind spots. So in the case that I'll be talking about today, um, when we sort of look at migration control as it plays out around a ship, um, we can, um, in a sense, see migration from the point of view of the ship and from the sort of authorities connected to that ship. And I think one of the things that this brings to light, for example, is um, what I'm calling the sort of terrestrialism of the social sciences, right? So uh, the geographer uh, John Agnew has written a um, very important piece on the territorial trap, you know, the extent to which sort of modern territoriality is in embedded um, in, in the social sciences. But I think there's an even more sort of pervasive terrestrialism. By this I mean this kind of assumption that, that social life takes place and that political life takes place and plays out on dry land. So one of the things that we find when we sort of look at migration from the point of view of a ship is that you know dry land is not taken for granted. So stowaways present a problem for political authorities and, 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 and for, 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 for shipping agents, not just because they sort of, in some ways, exist outside or temporarily outside the political order in the way that, that, that a lot of refugees find themselves outside the political order, but they were also outside of the terrestrial order. So getting them back onto dry land is itself a sort of political and a logistical challenge and, and a thing where a lot of unexpected events and processes play themselves out. The other reason, the other case I would make for looking at these material things like tunnels and trains and ships um, is that they reveal the sort of heterogeneity of migration control and its politics. So they're points where markets and commerce and migration strategies and politics all intersect. They're sort of they're therefore very sort of promising entry points. They get us, they move us beyond that sort of rather one-dimensional view that, you know, say that, that migration is a sort of struggle between states and migrants, because it's actually a, a, a much more of a multifaceted, multidimensional struggle. Um, so Jeanette Verstrater's work here is very interesting, a sort of study of, of the political economy of heartbeat detectors in the port of Rotterdam, or Lisa Schuster's work on, on the Euro Tunnel and, and the role that the, the train companies and the tunnel operators played in migration politics and its sort of scandals there. Um, I'm halfway through this book, and I thought it was a lovely little quote that, that sort of speaks very much to some of my interests, but so don't tell me what happens in the end. <laughs> um, I want to start with, with a sort of tale of two ships and uh, two photographs and two Canadian coasts, and I've presented this paper several times in, in Europe and in Asia, uh, and, and there I had to sort of explain in some detail what was going on. And here I'm going to sort of assume that, that, that we all kind of know to some extent what's going on. But here's a photo that appeared, I think, last year um, in the Toronto Star. And um, it's a sort of curious photo in many ways. It's Stephen Harper, obviously, and, and one of his able-bodied seamen there, um, uh, Jason Kenney, some security character. Um, but, you know, we kind of, it's, it's, a, it's an odd photo for many reasons. And, you know, one of them is that we're kind of used to uh, thinking of or, or seeing heads of state pictured on the bow of the ship or, 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 or on its bridge. You know, think of George Bush when he sort of rather um, fatefully announces mission accomplished on the, on the front deck of the Abraham Lincoln. But in this case, the head of state's pictured at the back of the boat at the stern. And, you know, it's tempting to sort of liken Harper to a sort of seaborne version of, of Walter Benjamin's Angel of History. You know, he sort of mentioned that his, his sort of coat is caught up in the winds of, of history, and he's sort of looking backwards while the sort of environmental destruction of the tar sands piles up at his feet. But, of course, the, <laughs> the, uh, the truth is obviously much more banal, and this is a, a, a photo op on board the, the Ocean Lady, the first of the two recent um, ships that 
that brought a um, large number of, of, of refugee claimants from Sri Lanka to Canada. And, and, and this is a photo op that's staged. And, uh, and as you all know, that, that this ship has, has sort of featured it very prominently in, it featured in the, in the uh, election campaign itself. Well, I think that the, the Sun Sea, the, the, the second one to arrive. Um, and it's been used, I've got a number of slides I'll show a bit later, it's been used as a backdrop in a lot of the press conferences that the Conservatives have been putting on and sort of very much played itself into, into the whole movement to sort of uh, redefine refugee law and to create this new category of, of sort of mass arrival. So there's a case there where, where ships and modes of transportation become entangled in law and politics and, 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 and that will be one of the things that I keep coming back to. But at the same time that um, that was happening on the West Coast, um, very curiously, a completely sort of, in, in a lot of ways, a parallel incident has happened on the East Coast, and, and we've seen the unveiling of this, um, this sculpture by uh, the architect Daniel Lieberskind. Um, and here it is, here's Kenny again, you know, he, first he was on board the Ocean Lady, now here he's cropping up on the East Coast at the unveiling of this sculpture, which is called, I think, the, uh, the Wheels of um, Conscience. And it's to commemorate um, the, the event um, and to, 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 to enact a certain reparation for the event um, of 1939, when the MS St. Louis was turned away, first from Cuba and then the United States and then, then from, from Canada as well, with uh, nearly a 1,000... Uh, Jewish refugees fleeing uh, Germany. So this uh, sculpture has now been installed in Pier 21 in Halifax. And, and I was quite struck that these two sort of events, if you like, happened um, in, in almost complete isolation from, the, from, from each other. You know, it's more than a vast continent between these two things. They, they seem to happen in completely separate worlds, you know, that, that we can have on the one hand this whole event on the West Coast that plays out and is sort of understood and represented as, as human trafficking and, and security and, 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 and at the same time on the East Coast we're sort of making amends for um, the, the, the sort of denial or the rejection or the refusal to recognize refugees and, and, and it, it, it can all happen in the same country uh, both involving ships. So those are two cases where uh, ships are sort of symbolically very prominent. But it's not just the ship in its different forms and states of disrepair that populates the public imagination of irregular migration today. It's not just boats and ships, but all manner of um, vehicles and <coughs> containers. Um, think of the public display of X-ray images, um, such as this, uh, with the, the sort of diaphanous spectral figures. Um, the, the way in which I think publics are assembled, and, and I would stress that they're never already there, sort of simply patiently waiting to be engaged. The way in which publics are sort of drawn into um, uh, and experience the politicization of what is often called irregular border crossing, these very distorted and uh, unsatisfactory forms of, of bearing witness. These would be unthinkable without the mediating work uh, undertaken by this field of material artifacts, trains, trucks, boats, planes, stations, airports. So I think that whatever affects may be set in motion by the image of the ocean lady or the sun sea, whatever impression they've made on public understanding of refugee issues in Canada, I'd be surprised if the dirty brown rust corroding the hull and the superstructure is not in some way uh, some small way at least, a part of that impression. In other words, I think these depictions, these mixtures of bodies and vehicles, as well as vehicles without bodies, are never innocent. So there's obviously there's a very important set of symbolic processes going on here. Um, but more than that, I think vehicles are important in another way uh, within the public politics of migration. Vehicles, roads and routes leave their imprint on certain bodies. They're present even when they're not in the frame. So if we think of the history of unwanted or demeaned migrations, how frequently its subjects or its targets are specified not just by institutional or legal categories, um, but in their sort of bodily existence by their forms of transportation. So if we think of the boat people, 
the wet backs, the stowaway, the hobo. In all these cases, an encounter with travel follows you around. So long after your journey is finished, you remain a boat person. You know, to put it like this, I'm, in 1989, I migrated to Canada to come and study at York as a PhD student. And I drove here in a rented car from New York City, right? Ten hours, my first site of Canada was Niagara Falls and arrived in Toronto at 10 at night thinking, where am I going, where am I going to stay? And then, you know, 10 years later, I kind of migrated back here again from the UK, as at this time as a permanent resident, um, on a plane from Heathrow, you know. And in both those cases, you know, they don't make me a car person, they don't make me a plane person. It would be ridiculous to sort of think of myself in those ways. In, in both those cases, my journey was absolutely sort of irrelevant and, and, and rather meaningless. So it's very interesting to think about the way in which people's journeys and, and modes of transportation can enter into politics, can become, in very complex ways, um, identities that are either imposed upon them or, in some cases, identities which they claim. So the boat people is not simply a sort of external identity imposed on people and rejected. There's actually a sort of also a kind of self-identification that goes on amongst some groups there. But one objection then to this sort of focus on, 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 on these sorts of images, taking them more seriously, thinking about vehicles more seriously, one objection would be, well, uh, isn't uh, migration really about human beings and not inanimate objects? Aren't vehicles just a means to an end, the conduct of a journey? Um, if we focus excessively on the journey, if we sort of spend a lot of time um, deliberating and lingering over these sorts of rather scandalous images, don't we sort of risk entrenching what um, uh, Nick DiGenova calls the sort of border spectacle, the sort of very ideological move that we should be unpacking? Um, because, I mean, one of the things that, that sort of goes on here is that there's a sort of metonymy, right? These sort of images of, of border crossing come to stand in for migration as a whole in a, in a lot of contexts this is migration, this is what migration looks like, or this is what illegal migration looks like. So there's a metonymy where this sort of part um, comes to sort of signify the whole. So don't we sort of risk becoming drawn into and entrenching that sort of move? Why not, you know, as an alternative, bring more positive features to the fore? Why not emphasize the many creative, productive, and experimental forms of life associated with um, migration, whether legal or illegal? Why not emphasize the novel solidarities, communities, and identities that new migrations have catalyzed? So I'm very mindful of these points, but I, I want to argue, nevertheless, that I think there are two good reasons why a critical politics of migration and borders should take vehicles and their infrastructures more seriously. I think I've already alluded to the first by beginning my presentation with, with these photographs. Um, and that is that I think we need a more sustained account of the symbolic work that vehicles do both incidental um, and calculated, and the difference that symbols make. So we need to take more seriously how the cultural feel of migration is mediated by images and depictions of transport and, and vehicle body entanglements. Um, and, and, and so we need to think through this sort of metonymy that, that, I've, that I've already alluded to. And, and here I would say that, you know, I sort of began the talk by saying that, that that, that vehicles and transportation infrastructures have been kind of taken for granted or, or overlooked. Um, but, and, and I said that that was a claim that I would have to um, qualify. Because if political scientists and perhaps sociologists haven't sort of given it, given th th this, this world a lot of attention, I think in the world of sort of visual art and cultural theory, uh, that's not the case at all. So I think in, in cultural theory and in, in, in visual studies, there has been a sort of sustained engagement um, by, by artists and, and, and theorists with vehicles and, and, and transportation. So one thing I think that would be useful is to bring some of that kind of work into, uh, uh, to sort of cross-pollinate it a bit and bring it more into, in, into critical studies of migration and critical security studies and border studies. And so the work here of the Swiss videographer Ursula Beeman, who sort of explores the, the medium of the shipping container, to talk about what she calls contained mobility. Um, the work of the, the German collective An Architecture, um, who mapped um, the border at Sangette. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I was on a, on a panel one, 
the first time I encountered this work. Um, and, you know, I was really intrigued and fascinated with, with what they were doing because they presented it in this very sort of matter-of-fact way, these sort of detailed maps that they'd made of, of the sort of border and refugee complex at Calais, which is where a lot of the migration um, into the UK was happening in the early 2000s. And, you know, I, I kind of wondered over what... Uh, it's always a bit of an enigma what, 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 what exactly they're doing with these maps. And, and one of my sort of... Uh, Hypotheses, at least, was that you know they're they're actually grappling with this sort of problem of representation. You know, how do you talk about this thing without being drawn into the sort of scandal of the border spectacle? You know, so you know, I wondered if they're sort of looking for a different kind of language, looking for a different medium. Hence, this very technical, neutral, abstract, diagrammatic depiction of of, of, of borders. Are they perhaps also sort of speaking about this new this border as a new frontier, you know, something that does need to be sort of mapped and understood, something for which we don't presently have an adequate uh, knowledge uh, uh, for. Or the work of, of the Italian group Multiplicity, who, who sort of take the, the, the trope, if you like, of the shipwreck. We're all sort of familiar with the shipwreck um, from, from sort of school and, and, and maritime history, but they sort of engage in a kind of zoonotic politics where they take the shipwreck and bring it into sort of migration politics, bring it into border politics, engage in a kind of counter-memorialization, you know, so in the way that shipwrecks are, are sort of memorialized often, they're kind of memorializing this, this dreadful shipwreck that, that, that the Italian government and its media completely ignored, shipwreck that, that sort of resulted in the death of many, many uh, migrants. So those are all instances you know, of where there is a sort of sustained engagement with the sort of symbolic field that's populated by vehicles and transport systems. And I think it'd be very interesting to explore that further. Um, but I think the second reason that I want to take vehicles, the second way in which one might take vehicles and, and infrastructures more seriously, um, has to do with what I'm calling sort of provisionally or, or heuristically a, a sort of mobile governmentality. So my claim is that we need to give vehicles a more central place um, because this will allow for a more sort of finely grained, contextualized account of the governmentality of migration. In other words, the vehicular and the infrastructural is more than a symbolic field. Vehicles and their infrastructure are also nodes, relays, surfaces, volumes in a dispersed and une uneven governance of population and territory. They don't exist outside the world of tactics, techniques, programs, and technologies dreamt up to regulate life, direct and harness mobilities, allocate value, and sort populations. Vehicles and their environments are irreducible sites of power relations. They are themselves little territories, mobile territories, on which games of power and resistance play out. So, I mean, we've seen a sort of remarkable surge in recent years of, of interest in Foucault's idea of governmentality, and a sort of connection of it to the empirical domain of, of migration. And this has been very productive because it sort of opened up the sort of field of things like international airports, detention centers, camps, fences, walls, databases, sanctuaries, new technologies of identification and verification. All of these things are being now sort of revealed as components, as an elements within a sort of much more wide and heterogeneous field of migration politics than was previously the case. So new worlds and strange objects and unexpected figures have all come into view. But my question then is, why stop there? Why confine this sort of extended engagement with this dispersed governmentality to these fixed structures and usually immobile sites? Why limit our photography to terra firma? Surely analyses need to be as mobile and as, in as inventive as the machinic flows they strive to understand. So what of governance in motion? What of governance at sea or in the air? You know, just think about how many... I've been trying to find figures about how many people are in the air at any one time on Earth, you know. Um, it's very hard to actually get to calculate a figure, but, you know, some people suggest it might be half a million. Um, and, and, and so there's an interesting thing in itself. You know, the population of a small city is at any one time in flight. And then if you add it in the numbers of people at sea you've got this sort of large population that's being governed sort of outside of any sort of territorial authority. It's being, connect being governed in ways connected to those territorial authorities, but, you know, you've got then the sort of strange combination of sovereign and, 
and pastoral power that's wielded by a ship's captain or a plane captain. You've got the pastoral authority that's exercised over you in, in the cabin of the plane, you know, which can take the sort of amusing forms of telling somebody that they've had enough to drink or just the sort of quotidian thing of making sure you've done your seatbelts up. But it can become a sort of more dramatic um, kind of power when it's about the deportation of, of, of people on, on civilian flights. Or we've got, and I was talking about this at lunch, the sort of phenomenon, say, of, of a border control that was exercised on moving trains. So, you know, experienced this as a kid traveling in Europe a lot of the times, the, 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 the way that the border guards would get on um, in, in one border station on one side of the border and then they sort of sweep through the train. So the train itself becomes a sort of time-space envelope, if you like, a sort of moving border um, and, and in your sort of processed um, uh, in motion. And it'd be really interesting to know a little bit about the history of that, um, that kind of border control that grew up around um, international railway system. So that's my second sort of angle, if you like, or, or, or case for taking vehicles and infrastructures more seriously. Um, this is just a sort of little diagram. You know, this is not so much part of a symbolic field so much as part of this sort of governmentality field, a sort of a little diagram instructing truck drivers uh, and, and, and sort of routiers on, on how to inspect trucks that are operating across borders. So I, I, I'm proposing a sort of um, provisional name for, for, for this um, set of uh, this constellation, if you like, via politics, where the via draws on the Latin word for road or way. Um, and it's metaphorical, but only up to a point. Um, and, you know, I'm conscious that uh, I don't want to sort of just create concepts for the sake of it. Um, there's enough concepts in the world already, you know, <laughs> there's still conceptual inflation. And we should have some sort of commission where you have to sort of, that, that oversees your concept. You have to get it approved by a commission of learned types. Um, but since that doesn't exist, I'll just engage in some conceptual inflation. Um, and so, uh, biopolitics for me then could, could cover these two things. It could, number two, it could be about sort of looking at representational strategies and practices in which images, symbols, affects, and materials associated with vehicles and routes are drawn into a politics of mobility. And I've talked about that at some length. You know, here, here are examples of, of that kind of via politics from above, if you like, you know, the way in which you know, the three wise men um, in front of the, the, the uh, I think, the Sun Sea, uh, here it is again at, at one of their press conferences. Um, but you could also talk about a sort of via politics from below, you know, the way in which um, symbols and images of transportation and routeways and journeys sort of are, are taken up in, in sort of in, in critical practices and, 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 and in subversive practices and clearly there's a relationship here between on the one hand the kind of police maps generated by ICMPD, EU and UNHCR and so on and then these sort of subversive types of mapping by the likes of Hakitektura. Um, I've been more interested though in this sort of the first strand, analyzing the politics of migration and mobility at the level of vehicles, roads, and tunnels, and so on, understood as contested material objects and disputed spaces, and possibly as, as little territorializations. William? Yeah. You asked me to shout at you for five minutes, and since you just started, and it's fascinating, we have a lot of time. Okay. So you can keep going for another half hour if you want to. No, no, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to do that. And yeah, no, no, because uh, it's, there's nothing worse than sitting in an audience and it's like being in a lecture, you know, like 15 minutes, you know, listening to somebody go on for 15 minutes. Who wants to do that? We just <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, nobody should have be subjected to the sort of things that we subject our students to, right? Uh, so the, the sort of first strand of via politics is what I'd like to explore a little bit in the five minutes that remains or that I'm imposing upon myself. Um, and, and I want to connect it to, you know, some work I'd already done on the policing of stowaways. Um, and it's a very Im imperfect connection. Well, actually, before I do that, I just wanted to backtrack a little bit and say a few, 
make a, say a few more sort of qualifying remarks about biopolitics, you know, and, and to defend this introduction of another concept when maybe some people might say, oh, we do, do we really need another concept? So, what, you know, for, for one thing, I could talk about this as securitization. A lot of what I've talked about, you know, we could say it's the securitization of the truck, it's the securitization of the ship. But, you know, I'm a little bit uh, dissatisfied with securitization because it's a bit, bit generic and it sort of seems to, to sort of fold too much under, uh, under uh, places too much under, uh, under the one heading. So I'm looking for some, to make some distinctions here, which is after all what, one thing that the concepts are, are all about. I could talk about this as dispersed borders. Um, and, and, I, and it certainly works um, as dispersed borders in some ways. But again, I, I, I want to focus more on the travel, on the journey, on the movement, on the passage, rather than the, than the line that sort of cuts across it and regulates it. Not that you know one can separate one from the other, because obviously they're, they're, they're connected, but I'd like to place more emphasis on the passage, the journey, the, 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 the line of flight, rather than the, than the bordering activity itself. Or to think about the bordering activity from the angle of, of, of the line of flight. Um, we could call it a politics of mobility. Um, but again, the, the, the politics of mobility seems to cover too much. Um, you know, the, 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 the decision by the Canadian government to, to, to require visas of, of, of Mexicans could be considered part of a politics of mobility, because after all, it contributes um, to the sort of asymmetries and, and, and inequalities in, in, in the rights and opportunities for, for movement and, 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 and traveling uh, across the earth. Um, it's a politics of mobility, but it's not necessarily a via politics. I think it becomes a via politics when it becomes part of a context, for example, that leads to people trying to negotiate borders and enter territories by walking through forests or, or by uh, climbing onto trains in particular ways. So for me, via politics is a much more imminent thing. It's much more imminent to actual vehicles and infrastructures themselves. Um, you know, it's contextualized by a wider politics of citizenship and mobility, but I want to sort of very much sort of delineate a space where one focuses sort of very intensely, if you like, on the actual interactions between humans and travelers and vehicles and routeways to sort of, in a, light, in, in a way, sort of define that as a field. And I want to define that in a field partly in a sort of way, you know, in the way that, that Benjamin might talk about a constellation. That, that one of the, the, the things I think about biopolitics is it would take, it, it's not just about migration, you know. Um, so if we're sort of thinking about the policing of canals, the policing of canals that were, were built in the 18th century, or the problems that the building of the railway post for, for, for policing and order and, and subversion in the 19th century, those are not necessarily phenomenon understood to fall within the remit of migration, but they could be sort of understood from the point of view of biopolitics. And those instances, those episodes, those sites could then be brought into as kind of dialogue or a, or, or a, a field of analysis with a lot of the things that today that, that, that are classified as migration. So it's partly about forging connections and, and networks between things that are normally placed in different theoretical and empirical and disciplinary areas. So it's a way of trying to cut across some of those divisions and, and set up some new resonances. I could call it as well mobilities, because mobilities is, a, is a, obviously a very popular and important um, new development in the social sciences. And, and a lot of the sort of material that falls under that heading I find immensely useful for looking at some of the things that, that interest me. But I don't want to use the term mobility, partly because everyone uses it, not just scholarly, but, but, but you know, the moment that, that, that the institutions and the organizations that we're studying themselves use that language, then I think sometimes there's a lot to be said for, you know, as Fuko says, to, to sort of make a move to the outside and to find categories that sort of aren't themselves embedded already embedded in sort of institutional and, and legal and, and, and political processes. So a word like biopolitics or a concept at least offers the opportunity to try to step outside that, to see mobility itself as a, as a concept with a history. You know, so we can say at what point do these various phenomena come to be understood as instances of something called mobility? Because the 19th century for the most part doesn't talk about mobility. It doesn't always talk about migration either. So I don't think we should fold everything under the heading of mobility. You know, like a lot of people now go back and sort of study the mobilities of the 18th century, the mobilities of, of people in, in industrializing cities. And it produces a lot of interesting insights, but it, 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 it runs the risk of anachronism. 
of sort of projecting very contemporary concerns and concepts onto the past. So I'd like via politics to sort of to, 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 to sort of stand outside that if possible. So I'll just say a few things about stowaways and, and just bring up a couple of things that, that connect to this discussion. Um, in the 19th century, the, 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 the stowaway was very common and, and, and before the 19th century, obviously. And, and this was a sort of typical way in which they were thought about and governed um, if they weren't th just thrown off the boat or killed. Um, basically, being a stowaway was a theft of passage and the stowaway was kind of assimilated into the ship and made to kind of pay back that passage by um, extracting a kind of forced labour from them. Um, here it says, they're forced, in fact, to work the passage out and the most unpleasant jobs are imposed upon them. That, I shudder to think what <laughs> the least pleasant <laughs> jobs on a 19th century ship would have looked like. But if you look at the sort of logs of the great um, ships and, 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 and journeys across the Atlantic in the 19th century, you see stowaway, well into the 20th century stowaways. So, you know, they classify people by their trades, so say carpenter, housemaid, doctor, stowaway. You know, so stowaways were a part of these journeys. You know, there were stowaways on, on every ship, just like there were rats. And then if we sort of jump forward 100 years, and, and here's um, what um, the sort of... I guess the, the, the prevailing norm about how you should govern stowaways today, and this is whatever you do, don't employ them. You know. Do not assimilate them into the ship. Do not take them on. And why? Because, well, this, this literature that I looked at, it's produced by the, 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 the insurers of the ships. There's two, at least two kinds of insurers. There's insurers who insure the actual physical infrastructure of the ship, that's hull insurance, but then there's this sort of third-party liability insurance, which is run by these people called the Protection and Indemnity Associations. And, and these have been around, they're some of the older forms of insurance, but they're basically there to sort of cover the cost of, you know, when your ship uh, leaks oil or damages someone else's goods or when someone on the crew does something illegal, kills somebody else, steals something... Um, it's, it, 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 they're covering those sorts of things. But they also cover stowaways. And stowaways is only a small part of what they do, but it's a significant part, nevertheless. So this is one of the, the, the sort of interesting kind of things that I first sort of uh, stumbled upon when I looked at this, was, you know, I had no idea, I did not anticipate that it would be these insurance companies who were the kind of main locus, if you like, of kind of uh, institutional knowledge and expertise uh, and, and practice when it came to the governing of stowaways at sea. And, you know, I found this very interesting because, in one sense, well, I mean, everything about stowaways sort of falls outside of what we think of as migration and migration control. And yet, here is, you know, it is a kind of migration control, it is a kind of bordering, but it's being done under completely different headings and under completely different institutional and legal auspices. So here we have these insurers who are a de facto kind of migration and, and border control. But they're doing it in a very sort of dispersed sort of way. So in a sense, the ship, you know, the, 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 there's a, a sense in which a border, the ship, the port ship interface is a kind of border that, that will be surveyed um, under the sort of instructions of, of these insurance. But, but there's a, there's a kind of border that, that is to materialize within the ship itself whenever, as soon as the stowaway is discovered, you know, that the instructions are that they have to be kind of isolated, um, uh, don't let the crew befriend them, um, try to obviously extract their identity and their nationality. And, and once the stowaway is discovered, it, it sort of sets off an entire set of processes that are kind of intended and, and, and have the main focus of getting them off the ship. So why are the insurers so worried about stowaways? Well, they're, they're worried because, not primarily because of the, um, the fees that they will have to pay, because they do have to pay fees, you know, under carrier laws, fees for having someone undocumented on, on, on the ship. There's a few thousand dollars that they might be liable for that. But much more problematic from the ship point of view, from the company's point of view, is the time and the, the loss of cargo, the, the, the fact that the ship could be held up in a port or deviated from its route. Um, that, you know, is a potentially enormous cost. So is this really about, you know, when, we, when we're seeing like a ship or when we're seeing like an insurance company, it's a, it's a knowledge of 
of migration. It's a very much a risk management kind of knowledge of migration that is that, that produces um, you know these kinds of maps, the kind of geography, if you like, of, of stowaway hotspots and places where you know ships have to take special precautions because there's a sort of uh, and, and this is a moving geography, obviously depends on you know what's going on in the world in different places, what sort of things are knowledge about which ports have become particularly problematic. Um, the numbers of stowaways are actually quite small, at least officially, and I'll, I'll sort of come back towards that, to that at the end. We're talking here, by the way, I should say, about stowaways, you know, people, sort of classic stow, if you like, who sneaks onto a ship. We're not talking about the phenomenon of sort of autonomous migrations that, are, that have come across, say, the Mediterranean on fishing boats. That's a different kind of phenomenon. So we have it's a sort of world, if you like, that's populated by these rather banal things like a checklist, which is sort of um, intended to sort of responsibilize the crew, you know, so that the, the, the ship does not carry around with it in uh, uh, migration control experts. It has just ordinary seamen and officers and, and, and so on. Um, but these sort of little, little devices that constitute a certain kind of, 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 of migration control effect if you like, at a distance. Um, that's one sort of very ordinary um, device. Uh, perhaps a more interesting one is the, is the loss prevention bulletin. And this is a, 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 a sort of bulletin uh, that, 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 that the insurers circulate, um, informing ships and, 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 and captains about all sorts of risks and things to be looking out for in particular ports, uh, changes in legislation. And this particular one... Um, comes from, from the UK Protection and Indemnity Club, and it's, it's alerting um, ships to, the, uh, the, to this, a, a particular kind of stowing away. Um, under the heading stowaway check requirements, it's saying um, we've had notice from the US Coast Guards in New Orleans. Um, masters and operators should be alert to stowaways trying to gain access to and hiding in rudder trunks on deep draft vessels and includes these photographs. Um, and in another one, we find out that, um, that, that what's happened here, I mean, if you, if you like, it, it sort of, it shows you, for one thing, that, that, that going back to my point about the ship itself or the vehicle or the vessel itself being a kind of material space around which struggles are playing out because, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing agonistic dynamic process, you know, that, 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 that the stowaways are always searching for new modes of ingress, if you like, and that, you know, once that these get learnt about, they get closed off and, 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 and maybe another one is opened up. But what, one of the things that, that, that sort of became apparent when I sort of dug a little bit more deeply into this was that you have ships going back and forth between South America and, and, and Africa. And um, what had happened was that the terms of sort of international trade were so favorable at a particular time that ships could go back empty. You know, they were making enough profit on, on, on the goods that they could afford to go back empty. And because the ship was empty, it's sort of higher up in the water. So the fact that it was higher up in the water sort of opened up this space above the rudder which sort of stowaways came to, to find out about. And, and, you know, there's obviously informal networks amongst the stowaways in which this kind of knowledge circulates. So it's an obviously incredibly dangerous and perilous activity. But it shows you in a, in a, like, in a sense how, how, how the border, in this sense, is it, it, like a network, a sort of dynamic interaction, if you like, between these various kinds of institutions and between the sea and global commerce and, and, and the ship and gravity. So I find that very interesting. The last thing I'll talk very briefly about is this deportation or repatriation industry. So getting the stowaways off the ship is, is a sort of political and logistical challenge in its own right. So the insurance companies have developed an entire sort of repertoire of tactics and strategies and formal and informal networks of knowledge. They have these people who are called correspondents. So the insurance companies have correspondents in every port and the correspondent is like a troubleshooter. They might be a local lawyer or, or, or somebody with sort of a very deep knowledge of the, of the commercial scene in the port. And, and, and these 
it's up to these correspondents, if you like, to sort of broker solutions. So it, as soon as the stowaway is found and decisions are made on board the ship about is it more profitable um, to carry on on the existing route and try to get the stowaway off at the port that we're heading to, or do we sort of rely on our knowledge of um, what this one uh, P and I calls stowaway exit corridors. You know, so it has a, again a knowledge of, of the world's ports in terms of which places are sort of more legally flexible, which places can we bribe um, customs officials, which places are sort of more hostile to the stowaway. So that entire kind of network and, and those techniques and logistics uh, comes into play. Um, and, and, and so again, this sort of getting the, the, the migrant back onto dry land itself becomes a sort of challenge. And, and again, here it's a negotiated thing because it's sort of interviews that we did with um, some of these insurance agents talk about the fact that, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, that there are what they call recidivist stowaways or the repeat offenders, people who are kind of making a living out of it. And um, these stowaways themselves have this knowledge that, um, that their presence is placing, you know, this huge cargo and this, this intercontinental enterprise at risk. And so that they have a certain kind of bargaining power, you know, in the sense that they're, they're in some cases, able to extract from the, the insurers or from the shipping people themselves money, kind of bribes, payoffs. If they'll agree to sort of leave the ship, get on the plane and take the flight back home to do all the things that the insurance companies and the shippers are required to do. So there's a sort of interesting negotiation and, and, and struggle that, that happens around this sort of repatriation process. But, like, if I left it at that, you know, that would be only to sort of focus on the more, um, I'm just going to finish in two minutes, the, the more sort of acceptable, if you like, legal face of this entire sort of field of regulation and politics. Because the sort of flip side of it, or the underside of it, is, is all the instances where stowaways are simply murdered. And... Uh, this transcript comes from a short film that the German filmmaker Anja Kirchner made. Called, it's a, it's a, a wonderful little 30-minute video called Supernumeraries. And she sort of interviews sort of ex-sailors and things who talk about how frequently the, 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 the killing of, of the stowaway happens. So, I mean, to, to, if I was to sum up a, or make one final observation about this, there's something very unique and specific to this particular mm, scenario. Um, in, in, in his work um, on carbon democracy, John uh, uh, Timothy Mitchell um, talks about the way in which coal miners and dock workers and railway workers at a particular time in world energy history acquired a remarkable amount of political leverage, right? When, you know, when we had a coal-based economy, um, the, 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 the coal workers and the rail workers and the port workers had this sort of potential um, to, 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 to inflict massive sort of disruption on the system. And this kind of accounted for, uh, or helps to explain, Mitchell argues, the sort of political leverage and, 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 and the sort of mass politics that kind of really crystallized around those particular forms of trade unionism and labor. The, 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 the sort of strategic relationships that, that actually played out around the ports and, and the coal mines. And, and, and I think that's important to bear in mind because when I started off with this, I was only looking at the sort of actual concrete material interaction of bodies and ships. But you can't sort of look at that in isolation from the larger transportation system. So one of the, the, the peculiar things, if you like, about the stowaways is that... Um, Whereas with coal mines, we're talking about mass movements, you know, that it takes a sort of mass movement, a, a mass union to, to, to disrupt um, that uh, regime. Here, we're talking about a, a, a sort of encounter, if you like, where great value is circulating in transoceanic trade networks, and yet it can be disrupted by the presence of one or two or three people on a ship who by that virtue, acquire a certain kind of leverage. It, 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 so it's a strange kind of interaction, if you like, between one, two, three people and a vast container ship. But then the flip side, or the, the, the other side of this, is that, okay, that happens because of, by virtue of the unique characteristics, perhaps, of, 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 of shipping and transoceanic uh, 
trait. But, but the other feature of it is that it's happening at sea. And, and, and so, you know, the, the, the sinister underside of that is that, that there's still the kind of ancient experience of the sea or notion of the sea in operation in those cases. You know, the, the idea of the sea is a place beyond law. The, the idea of the, uh, of the sea that, that Carl Schmitt talks about in places in Lemus of the Earth. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, the stowaway can have this leverage because of this asymmetry. On the other hand, they can just be this bit of life that can be dumped over the edge of the ship. And the instances where we know about these are extremely rare, but they happen in an ongoing way all the time. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I've gone well over my presentation. <laughs> We'll have um, around half an hour of questions.